stay up here. Yeah, yeah. Get you a, get you a seat right there too. Yeah, you can play keys for me. Uh, and uh, for those, what I, what I want to do, as Kevin was uh, speaking, it, it just like in that moment, I I pictured a pictured a story from the Bible where um, the man he was a uh, paraplegic and he couldn't walk, and he had some friends that uh, Jesus was teaching in his house, and they were like, you know what, I we need to get our friend to Jesus so he'll get healed, and uh, you know just crazy friends and that's what we need in our life and uh and those those friends they you know they they took their friend that was laying on a bed that couldn't move and they got a rope and they lowered him down to Jesus and um now does this have anything to do with people owning businesses I don't know but uh it just it was they did that and it just made me it went along with my message tonight of just people need encouragement and those four friends did everything they could for their friend to get to the feet of Jesus and just to bless their friend and help their friend and help their friend prosper. And uh, as Kevin was talking up here about his business and, you know, he had his dream and I was just like, you know, the devil does want you to fail. The devil doesn't want you to succeed. The devil doesn't want you blessed. So with those that are saying that have businesses, and this is nothing against people that don't have their own business or maybe work for someone else, but what I want us to do is if you see someone standing, I want you to stand up, and I want you to go over there, and I want you to lay hands, because we're just going to pray. I'm going to say a prayer, and I want you just to put your hands on people that maybe you see standing up. If You don't have to get up if you don't want to, but this is just if you want to, and I want you, if you just want to sit at your seat and stretch your hand towards them, that is completely fine too. But we're going to pray over people that have businesses, because the devil doesn't want your business to prevail. He doesn't want to see you blessed. But you know what? God does, and God sees ahead, and God's going to bless that. And we're going to pray that God blesses that tonight. So just reach your hands over to people, and we're going to pray now. God, we come to you right now in Jesus' name, Lord. We thank you for these businesses in our church, God. And I just pray that what the devil has created for evil, you will turn around for your good because you are for us. And that means nobody, nothing can be against us. So I speak just prosperity in their business. I speak blessings in their business. I pray that you're sending people their way to help grow their business. I, I pray ministering angels to go out and get the money for their businesses. I just pray that just things are working out and falling together and falling into place. And they're not taking any steps back, but they're just keep going ahead. They're keep moving forward. And then when we look back from this years from now, months from now, we're going to look back and we're going to say, wow, God, this was only you because you did this. Not me. We didn't do it ourselves. Not by ourselves. Not our own employees. But you did this. And the only way we know this because it's a miracle of where we are now from where we were. So we just pray right now just for financial blessings in these businesses in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. See, I, I want to I be like those guys that lowered their best friend down at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because they didn't care. They just said, we're going to do whatever we can to get our friend to the feet of Jesus. And I want to be that in people's lives. I want, I want to be the kind of person that you come with me with an idea, and I'm like, you can do it. And I want you to come with me to like a dream and be like, man, this is my dream in life. I want to be like, you can do it. I mean, I want you just to come, and I want to be the person that says, you know what, let's do it. Let, you, can, you got this. Why? Because, I mean, there was no possible way this guy was going to get to the feet of Jesus. They said the house was packed. There was people all around like that. But they made a way for their friend. That means that, you know what, that means there's always a way. So I just want to be that person just to encourage people. And so the, my message tonight is just encourage one another. You know, we just, actually what inspired this message tonight is, I'll be completely honest, can we be transparent? Because, I mean, it's not like I'm preaching to a thousand people. It's just like, you know, a couple of you guys. So we can have fun. We can mess around. We can have jokes or whatever. But uh, honestly, coming up to today, I didn't have a message. I'm... I'm like, I don't know what to talk about. How to, you know, I'm used to doing youth ministry, and you got, you know, junior high and high school kids, and you can just, not, not going to say wing it, but, you know, you talk for five, ten minutes, and after that, you lose their attention. So I'm like, man, I was just struggling, struggling. And actually, while I was working out this morning with my good buddy Will over here, it just, it made this message all come together. And so if you want to thank anyone, if you get anything from this message, you can thank Mr. Latu over there. Um, for just all his input on my message for tonight. But the title of my message, Encourage One Another. If you got your Bible, 
or you can look up on the screen. Uh, one of the passages I want to look at tonight is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. And this is so important. This is Paul um, speaking right here. And he's speaking to the um, church. Uh, uh, he's speaking to a church, actually a community of people. And he says this in verse 11. He says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. I'm going to read again. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. You know, that's what the church is supposed to do, encourage one another. Like you say, someone comes to you and say, hey, man, I got this idea. I got this dream or I'm doing this or I'm going through this. You can do it. We got this. And you just start encouraging them. And then in verse, uh, um, actually in First Thessalonians 5, now 13 and 11, it says this, get along among yourselves, each of you doing your part. Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on. Gently encourage the stragglers. We got any stragglers in here? Not in here tonight, right? The stragglers stayed home. But they need to watch this message. Gently encourage the stragglers and reach out for the exhausted. You know, the exhausted sometimes need encouragement. People that are just tired, people that are just been going through life, getting beat up, they need encouragement too. A lot of times we just, we, we, we only encourage the people around us, the people in our circle. It's like, yo, go find someone that's tired of life, exhausted of life, going through hell, and say, you know what? It's going to be okay. And encourage them. Exhaust, pulling them to their feet. Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs, and be careful that when you get on each other's nerves, you don't snap at each other. Anyone ever get on someone's nerve? Yeah, and you snap. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your, your Rita and Duane over here like patting each other. Hey, we all, a lot of us are married in here. Yeah, our spouse, we, we snap sometimes. Look for the best in each other. I love that part. Look for the best in each other. You know, some, you can find bad in everyone you look at. You can look at, I mean, we could be best friends. I mean, my wife could, my wife could tell you some bad about me. Why? Because you can always find bad in someone. No matter how perfect you think they are, no matter what you think or how holy they are, how spiritual they are, how much money they have. No, there's imperfections in people. But look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. It means that you could bring the best out of people. You know, there's people in your life that bring the worst out of you. You don't want to be around those people. You want to be around the people that bring the best out of you, that bring good things to you. But it seems like the culture that we live in now, the world that we live in now is so full of looking at people's imperfections and highlighting their imperfections, wanting to find what they're terrible at, what, when they mess up. It's like the headline. It's like when they mess up, we want to just magnify it. And then we like condemn people. And then we just show them. It's like, I told you so. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have started that business. You shouldn't have acted like, I mean, and we just start highlighting that. And we look at that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about people's imperfections, but it shouldn't be the only thing that we talk about. We got to encourage people. We got to talk about their highlight reel. We got to talk about what they're good at, what they're great at, what they're doing right. Even if they're doing something wrong. But we want, we want to look at the wrong in everyone. That why? Because that is our culture today. Is we want to fall. Oh, man, they're messing up. They're messing. Well, what are they good at? Well, I encourage what they are good at. So some of us, I mean, and some of us, we're, we're trying our best. We are doing our best. We are being our best. Like we're leading the next generation. We're, some of us are loving our spouses. Some of us are raising our children. Some of us are securing the bag. Some of y'all are like, if you're older, like, you're like, what is securing the bag? That just means you bring home the bread. You bring home the money. You're doing that. You're doing a good job. You're serving our country. Some of us are serving our country. Some of us are serving our church. Some of us are helping our communities, and we're doing the best, and we're trying to do our best, and we're doing the best we can. But do you know what we could use a little more of, even though we're doing everything like that? We could use a little more encouragement. People always could use more encouragement, even when they're doing the right thing. You don't just have to encourage them when they're in the pit. You don't have to just encourage them when they're down and when they're dirty or whenever they're going through it all. Even when they're doing the right thing, we can still encourage people. Paul, right here, he's speaking to the Christian community, and he's saying, y'all need to encourage one another. 
Why? Because I truly feel like he's telling that to a church. That means it's in the Bible for a reason. That means churches need to encourage one another when they walk in. There, you know, a lot of churches, and I hope this is never our church, but some churches don't encourage one another. Some, churches, some people are scared to go to church. Why? Because they think they're going to get condemned. Because they think they're going to get judged. One, that's their problem because they're just thinking that's going to happen. But then sometimes that actually is true because they are thinking that. But it's saying we need to encourage one another. This is an asset that needs to be in the Christian community. People can't go to the next level in their life without encouragement. You can't. Why? We need encouragement from people. We need people to help us. We need encouragement from people or we can never go to the next level. We can't grow unless we get encouragement. We can't grow. Yeah, you can do everything you can at your house. You can, you can get in the word yourself. You can get it in your praise, right? You can get in your closet. You can do all that. You can pray to God. You can do all that. And yes, you can grow a little bit, but you want to grow more. You need encouragement from other people. You need encouragement from your spouse. You need encouragement from your friends. You need encouragement from your church family. You need encouragement from your connect groups. You just need encouragement from everybody. And if you ain't receiving encouragement, you better be the one giving encouragement. Are you awake tonight? Just letting you know, just seeing if you're awake. People can't be who God has called them to be without encouragement. You cannot be who God has called you to be without encouragement from people, without encouragement from the people around you. Why? Yeah, you could get that call and you say, I'm going to beat that. But if, if no one ever helps you, if no one ever talks to you, if no one ever helps you fulfill that dream like we just prayed over businesses, why? I remember when Kevin, he, he thought about, so I was always telling him, right? I was like, you can do it. You got it. You should start that. I, like, I told him like years before he should have started it. He, he should have listened to me a long time ago, but he, he finally did. He finally did. But we, when we answer the call, we, we need encouragement to fulfill that calling in our life. But see, the problem is people are dealing with so much discouragement. So many people in life, they're dealing with discouragement. That's why as a body of Christ, that's why as people, that's why as believers, that's why as Christians, we got to be the one encouraging people. Why? Because there's so much discouragement in the world. The enemy is using a weapon on your life, on your business's life, on your family's life. And that weapon is called discouragement. The devil wants you discouraged. He does. He, he wants to destroy you. He want, like, Just like Kevin said, he wants to take you out. But we have to come back and fight with encouragement. Why the devil's fighting with discouragement, we got to come back with encouragement. Can I tell you something about the devil? This is, you might not know this. I hope you do. But the devil actually cannot tell the truth. He is 100% a liar. There is no truth to the devil ever. Whatever he ever says, it is automatically a lie. So whenever he tells you you're not going to make it, you better take a little praise break. Why? Because you are going to make it. You better start encouraging yourself and say, you know what, I am going to make it. Just because when the devil says, you know what, that door is never going to open in your life, you better take a little praise break and encourage yourself. Why? Because God's saying, I am going to actually open up that door. And not only am I going to open up that door, I'm going to open up a window of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. That's in the Bible. The devil's a liar. But he wants to just discourage you. That's how he's going to destroy you. Just by making you discouraged. But we need encouragement. Paul says, encourage one another and build each other up. You want to build someone up? You want to make someone just like on a high, like on a whole nother level? You encourage them. That's how you build them up. Encouragement builds people up and helps them go to the next level. See, we don't need more information in our life. We need encouragement. Like, don't tell me to pray. I know I probably need to pray for this situation that I'm in. I don't need to hear that from you. I don't need more information. What I need is just some encouragement from you. Like it's important. Yeah, yeah, pray. Like tell me, but it's all, all the time. It's like, I, I know what to do. A lot of us, we know what to do. We know we need to show up to church. We know we need to serve, which we've talked about that before. We know we need to worship. We know we need to get involved. We know all this stuff, but we don't need everyone telling us that all the time. What we need is just a little bit of encouragement saying, you can do it. You got this. See, we need people to push us. 
I don't, I don't need you to teach me. I need you to push me. Listen, like, I don't want your number if I can't push you. I Delete my number in your phone. Don't ever get my number if you're not going to push me. Think about it. Like, we need, we need to be pushing people. And by pushing people, I mean encouraging people. But say we want, we want to start teaching people, well, the reason you're going through this is because this, you ain't living right, you're not doing. No, just push me and encourage me. Push me. In, the, in this season in my life, I don't, I need people to push me. Why? Because sometimes, like, this is actually a hard job. Now, I'm speaking from my point of view now is this ain't easy to get up on a stage sometimes. Sometimes I don't want to get on a stage sometimes. I'm sure my dad, Pastor Bracken, doesn't want to preach every Sunday. He's good at it. He's great. He's a great teacher. But I'm sure some Sundays he would like to sleep and sleep in too, just like a lot of the people in the church, or not show up. Or say, oh, do you know what, I'm going to serve and then not commit and then not show. I'm sure my dad would like to take some time off. But it's like, yo, maybe give the pastor a little encouragement. Say, you're doing a great job. It's been 30 years. You might be tired, but do you know what, just keep going. Pastor Brody, you've been a youth pastor for nine years. What? I'm like, can, I, can, y'all, can y'all pray for me real quick? Because this Sunday, I'm going to be 30. And uh, <laughs> Rita's laughing, but like. That's a big deal for me. I'm like, I wish I was like still 22 or something. And, uh, and you know, and I'm, 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 my body's starting to feel 30. Me and, me and Will, we, we, we decided to do like a 30-day no sugar. I lost like the first, the second day, first day probably. And, uh, and I had like a coffee over there that Charlie brought me. Thanks, Charlie. And uh, I told Tara, I, she, she had a soda in her hand. I said, hey, that's got sugar. Is that a zero sugar soda and she's like no I'm not doing it and I was like yeah me neither and she looked at me up and down she said clearly and I was like like Terry you need to push me like kick that coffee out the way or something but no I mean like ministry can be hard like but people don't understand like in the congregation like yo push the pastors push the serve push the volunteers I mean it, it ain't easy serving at church. Sometimes it ain't even sh- easy showing up, but you got to push your family like, hey, we're going to go to church even though we don't feel like it today. Just push, push. Man, see, I don't, I don't know who you are in here. Maybe you've been pushing a lot. Maybe you've been the one encouraging a lot, but I believe in sowing and reaping. And I believe if you've been a pusher, guess what? God's going to send some people on your path to start pushing you. Man, I've been a pusher for so long, just encouraging people all the time. And I just believe in my life, God's going to send some pushers my way. Not that he already hasn't, but I just need a little more. Can you believe for that? Can you believe that God's going to send you some pushers? Maybe you say, I really haven't been pushing. Start pushing people. You can start now. But it's a spiritual law. It's seed time and harvest. So as you're sowing pushing, that means your harvest is going to come and God's going to send some pushers in your life to encourage you, to build you up. Why? Because when you encourage people, that will what builds people up. And, you know, this is actually for everyone. Paul, he's talking to the church, but if you think about it, in the church, there's all kinds of people. So that means don't just encourage your best friend. Don't just encourage your pastor. Don't just encourage your family member. That's just finding some random person and encouraging them. Why? It's like there's all different kinds of people in the church. It means encourage the old. Encourage the young. Encourage the rich. Encourage the poor. Encourage the sick. Encourage the healed. It's just, man, I'm going to find someone and I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to be at Walmart and I'm going to encourage the cashier. I mean, I'm just a... Encourage someone. If you don't know what to do with your life, be an encourager. If you don't know who you are in life, be an encourager. That's the most important thing. God is trying to teach us that giving is more than just your finances. See, a lot of times we just think about giving towards people and giving our life and it's just fine. No, it's giving encouragement. And we miss this because this is like the cornerstone of the Christian life. Encouragement. But it's not just about money. Whenever we give, it's about giving your time, your talents, giving words, giving encouragement. And then that's whenever you actually find your purpose. Whenever you start encouraging people, God's going to start showing you things. Can can we look at a story? 
It's 7.54. What time do y'all normally get out of here? Nine? Okay, cool. Go with me to Acts chapter 16, real quick. I got two stories, and then I'm completely done. Acts chapter 16. I love this story so much. This is one of my, this is my favorite Bible story ever. And I actually say that about every story that I ever teach. But um, at that time, it becomes my favorite. But Acts chapter 16, 22 through 24. Well, actually, we'll, we'll start in verse 20, 25, but I'll give you some little context before. Paul and Silas are doing what God told them to do. They're, they're going out there preaching the gospel. They're getting people saved. They're he- doing healings. They're doing what God has called them to do. And do you know what? Maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you, and you're doing what God has called you to do. But what happens is they end up in a place they're not supposed to be, even though they were in the will of God. Maybe you're in here, you're like, man, Pastor Brody, I've, I've been tithing. I've been so in my time, I've been given, I've been faithful, I've been having a relationship with God, I've been in my word, but I just feel like still things aren't going right. That's exactly this story right here. They find themselves, it says, they find themselves in prison. And right before they actually got to prison, they actually just got beaten. It says they got beaten black and blue. So that just means back then, you know, you don't, it wasn't just a punch in the face. It's that they would like hang them upside down and beat their feet where they couldn't walk. That's what they did back then. So they just got beat. Like, that doesn't sound fun whatsoever. Has anyone ever, like, slapped your feet while you were on the couch? I don't know. Sometimes I just walk up to my wife while she's sitting, and I just, like, grab her foot, and I just slap it. But it's because I love her, you know. I can do that. Some of y'all are like, he's abusive. Husband, I'm not, I promise. Okay, verse 25. I said we're going to, I'm just going to talk to you tonight. Is that all right? All right. Verse 25 says, along about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing a robust hymn to God. Many scholars believe it was Cornerstone, right, by Hillsong. You know that song? That's what they were singing. It could be any song, I guess. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Why? Because whatever you're going through in life, people are still always watching you. They're still always listening. Want to know, what are you going to do in this circumstance? What are you going to do in this situation in your life? What are you going to, whenever you're flat on your back, what are you going to do? Whenever you're at the mountaintop at the highest peak, what are you going to do? The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then without warning, a huge earthquake came. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw the door swing loose and on the hinges, assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in. Figured that he was as good as dead anyway. When Paul stopped him, don't do that. We're still here. Nobody's run away. I'm going to stop right there real quick because I just feel like if you just got beat, black and blue, hung upside down, had your feet just punched in by like, whatever they used, boards, whatever, you're going to decide to sit in your jail cell and just say, you know what, I think I'm just going to sing to God right now. It, I believe that Paul and Silas, before that even happened, they had to encourage one another, like, it's going to be okay. We're going to get out of this. We're here for a reason, right? They didn't just, like, sit there like, oh, man, I can't feel my feet. All right, we're going to sing now. They had to encourage one another that they were going to get through it. And then it says, it says, Nobody has ran away. So then the jailer thinks he's about to do himself in. But now what? Now they have to encourage the jailer, the one that's been put him in there, the one that whipped him, the one that just beat him. Now they're about to encourage him. The problem is a lot of times people in our life, after they've talked bad about us, after they've talked about our mama, after they've done us wrong or whatever, the last thing we want to do is encourage them, right? They say, oh, no, we all still here. Come over here. Let me tell you about God. Let me encourage you a little bit. Like, this is crazy. This is, this is like mind-blowing stuff right here. The jailer got the torch, and he ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved to really live? They said, put your entire trust in the master Jesus. Then you'll live as if you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. They went out, they went on to spell out the detail of the story to the master. The entire family got in on this part. So it goes on, they, they end up having a big dinner. They went to the guy's house. The jailer like made them comfy beds. It says he washed their wounds. 
and all that. And then I want to I wanna go down in verse 38. It says, actually verse 39, it says, walking out, that means they ended up, actually, they got out of jail. Somehow they ended back up in jail the very next day. I don't know how it doesn't tell us, but to, for my, what I think happened is they ended up getting caught and they just took them right back to jail. Because then it says, finally, they're walking out of jail. Paul and Silas went straight to Lydia's house, saw their friends again, and encouraged them in their faith, and only then went on their way. So it means Paul and Silas, they encouraged them, got the people saved. Then they had to go back to jail. Then they got out of jail again. And then they went back to the people and said he encouraged their faith. Just encouragement. Like that's the kind of life I want to live. It's saying I'm going to find people that like to be around me. And I'm just always going to encourage them. I'm always going to go up to them. I'm always going to believe in them. And I'm going to encourage them. Next story, 2 Kings chapter 40. I told you we'll be quick. Is this okay? Eight o'clock. Second Kings chapter four, verse two. Actually, we'll start in verse one. It says, one day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to Elijah, your servant, my husband is dead. You well know what a good man he was devoted to God. And now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect my two children as slaves. Elijah said, I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Now, if you have your Bible here, I want you to underline that because that's such an important statement. What do you have in your house? Nothing, she said. Well, I do have a little oil. Here's what to do, said Elijah. Go up and down the street and borrow jugs and bowls from all your neighbors. And, and not just a few, but all that you can get. Then come home and lock the door behind you. See, it's important what you do in private. That's why I said lock the door behind you. Because what are you doing in private? When the door's shut and nobody's looking, how are you living your life? What are you doing whenever nobody's watching? That's important. That's not the message, but... It's important. Pour your oil into each container. When each is full, set it aside. She did what he said. She locked the door behind her and her sons. As they brought the containers to her, she filled them. When all the jugs and bowls were full, she said to one of her sons, another jug, please. He said, that's it. There are no more jugs. Then the oil stopped running. She went and told the story to the man of God. He said, go sell the oil and make good on your debts. Live both you and your sons on what is left. So we're going to come back to this story, but what I want to ask you is, what are you great at? Think about it right now. What are you great at? If someone asked you, besides me, if they just came up to you on the street and say, hey, what are you great at? What would you answer? Because the problem is, I asked myself that today, and I couldn't come up with an answer. I didn't know what I was great at. And it's not because I'm so humble or anything like that. It's because the world has discouraged us. The devil has discouraged us thinking that we're not going to mount up to things, that we're not good at things, that we're not going to be great at anything in life. And so maybe you're here like, I don't know what I'm great at. See, what I love about this story is Elijah didn't ask, what do you wish you had in your house? He asked, what do you have left in your house? What do you still have in your house? Why? Because God is going to bless what you have left. What you have left, the time you have left on this earth, God is still going to bless that. Not what, oh God, can I just have this or I need this or can you? No, I'm go he's going to use what you have left. The oil you have, that's all that you need. The strengths that you have, that's all the strengths that you need. The experiences you have in your life, that's all the experiences you need in this life. That's what you need. Notice this, the oil only flows when it's poured, though. When she was pouring, it never stopped. You could pray over it. You could cry over it. You could feel bad over it. And the enemy will try to do everything that he can to get you not to pour. 
to get you not to encourage other people, to get you not to encourage yourself. He's going to do everything he can for you not to encourage people, not to encourage yourself. Why? Because he knows if you keep going, it's going to keep on flowing. If you keep encouraging people, it's going to keep on going. You're going to get encouragement back. People are going to encourage you. But he's going to try to do everything that he can not to get you to pour. And the problem is some of us have stopped pouring. Some of us have stopped encouraging people, encouraging the church, encouraging our spouse, encouraging our friends, encouraging the people around you. Why? Because we're discouraged with ourselves, because we've been hurt, because we're in pain. And because of that, we've stopped pouring. You used to encourage people. You used to be a light to people. You used to be fun to be around. But something happened. You got discouraged and you stopped doing that. See, I've tried to feel sorry for myself when I was discouraged. I've tried to pout. I've tried to have been like, nothing's going to happen. I've been there. I was like probably there a week ago. I tried it and nothing worked. Nothing happened. But then I've also tried to encourage other people when I was discouraged. And I felt like as I encourage other people why I was discouraged, I'm like, this isn't, like, I don't have anything to give. I want someone to encourage me, though. And God, God gave me this quote. It says, bitterness will keep you from pouring out what you have while you wait for what you want. Think about it. Bitterness will keep you from pouring what you have while you wait for what you want. If you just keep waiting for what you want, you keep waiting for someone to, you ain't ever going to be able to pour out. You ain't ever going to be able to encourage someone. You ain't ever going to be able to do anything. If you just keep waiting for someone to do it for you, you got to go do it for someone else. You got to go do it for yourself. See, I bet this woman, I bet she was a little disappointed that she had to pour one of the only things that she had. And it's frustrating when you have to pour into someone else, when you really wish someone would just pour into me. When someone would just encourage me. But the more you pour, the more it flows. The more she poured, the more it flowed. The more jug she had, the more it just kept coming. And finally, whenever she, they couldn't fill up any more jugs, it just, it ran out. It finally did. See, my wife, uh, she, uh, she's an awesome cook awesome. Now I'm speaking in faith right now. And she's not in, I don't know where she, she I think she's next door doing worship and youth. And um, she's not a very good cook. But what I love about it is so she'll, she'll, she'll try. She'll really put forth the effort. Like, you know what, I'm going to make Brody a really nice meal. We're going to, you know, bake some. I mean, she tries to like, every once in a while, she tries to go all out. And the thing is, one of my favorite meals that she makes is actually only like a dollar ninety-eight noodle when then you throw taco meat in it. But and she knows that's one of my favorites. It would be so easy to just make all the time, and I'd be completely happy because I'm not a hard person to please. But she wants to please me, so she tries to make this fancy meal and you know, watches, you know, or whatever y'all watch TikTok videos, or I don't even have a TikTok, but she'll watch the TikTok, like how to do recipes and everything like that. And she'll do all that. And it's awesome because, yes, my favorite meal is the $1.98 noodle, but I love it, and I love when she does that because I'll be in the kitchen, like, encouraging her while she's making this nasty meal and I'm like you can do it babe we got this like we're on year five right now and we're still struggling in the kitchen but we got this and then we'll sit at the table and we'll like be eating this chicken and it's like what are we putting in our mouth and it it can be real like discouraging but we're still encouraging like we got this and everything like that see I feel like that sometimes though whenever I preach I'm like man I'm coming with a great message to these youth I'm or maybe even my dad feels like this, and he's like, I'm bringing the fire. I got all these scriptures and everything, and we feel like people really aren't accepting it. We're like, why are we even doing this? We could just feed them the $1.98 noodles. We could just give them a scripture and a story and be like, okay, we're going to leave. Like, we don't have to lay hands on people. We don't have to, like, but it's so important that we still do it. And you know what? The, the thing is, we're looking, 
we want all that encouragement. We want people to like that. But I realized today while I was planning this message, we're not doing it for you. We're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for God. Everything that we do, we are doing it for the Lord. We're pouring it out for the Lord, not for them, not for you. Encouragement's good for you. It's good for me, but it's really for the Lord. And last, and I'm closing, it says the jugs that Elijah told that lady to go get, to actually go get, for the sons to go get from all the people. If you look, all the jugs that they got were actually empty. Empty. He didn't say go get jugs that were already full. Go get, you know, pitchers that already had oil in them. And all the ones that they got is why? Because God can't fill what is already full. Think about it. God can't fill what is already full. So make sure you pour out your pride. Make sure you pour out your opinions before you start actually pouring. Because while someone's trying to pour into you and encourage you, if you're prideful, if you got opinions, they can't ever get nothing. It's got to be empty right there. And yeah, it's important to be full of God, but actually too, I want to be empty so God can just fill me up. Right? Amen. You start pouring, and it's going to start flowing. And it's going to keep flowing until you stop pouring. Can I pray for you tonight? God, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. God, we just thank you just for how good of a God you are, how great you are, God. And I pray that this church will never stop pouring. This church will never stop encouraging people. This church will never stop encouraging the community. This church will never stop encouraging all the other nations that we maybe bless or attend or where we send that off to. I pray that we just never stop encouraging. And I pray that if anyone is discouraged in here, God, that you are the comforter, you are the healer, you are everything that they need in here tonight, God, that they won't be discouraged anymore, that they will leave here built up and encouraged because of your word, because of what you did on that cross. So we just thank you and praise you for tonight. And as we leave here today, God, our lives will be changed. That we'll be a light in this dark world that we live in, Lord. And we'll just be a light of just encouragement to everyone we come across. And people will be like, man, you're so happy. You're so loving. You're so full of encouragement. Why? Because those are the people that you called us to be. When Paul told the church and the community, build each other up. That's what we're going to do. And that is our goal. That is our vision. That is our mission. In Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. All right, well, I love you. And uh, dad will be back uh, on Sunday. So uh, I'll see you around. Or, and thanks for coming tonight. And then tell everyone that didn't come that they missed out. See ya.